Hello and welcome to our session today. My name is Jane Houston and I'm the Clinical Director of Midwifery and Women's Health at Frontier Nursing University. I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Anzi Corcoran, who's the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and also the Frontier Nursing University Professor of History. She's a certified nurse midwife and a women's health nurse practitioner. Her clinical experience includes full scope care in a private midwifery owned practice and a military setting, outpatient only care in a number of collaborative practices and care of underserved women in a community free clinic. Dr. Corcoran earned a Bachelor of Science in Nursing and a PhD in Nursing from the University of Virginia, a Master of Science in Nursing from Case Western Reserve University and certificates as a nurse midwife and women's health nurse practitioner from the Frontier School of Midwifery and Family Nursing. I'm very honoured to introduce my colleague, Dr. Corcoran. Thank you. Hello and thank you for joining me for Mary Breckenridge, Steady in the Saddle, Resilient Leadership and the Frontier Nursing Service. The goals for this presentation are to explore the life and work of Mary Breckenridge as a historical exemplar of leadership and resiliency. And I hope the presentation can inspire today's leaders to enhance their own leadership resiliency. So I'll begin by sharing a description of Mary Breckenridge provided by longtime Frontier Nursing Service nurse, Betty Lester. When Mary Breckenridge came into a room, funnily enough, you felt you had to stand. She was the commander in chief. You felt you ought to salute. She didn't expect it, but she just gave that impression that she was somebody that you looked up to. What was it about Mary Breckenridge that created such an impression in the people she led? In my current leadership roles, I have been reflecting on the qualities of outstanding leaders and what holds others back from leadership excellence. Along with other historians, I've studied many aspects of the Frontier Nursing Service and by extension the life of its founder, Mary Breckenridge. But in this paper, I examine Mary Breckenridge's leadership with a specific focus on her resiliency and how her life experiences built that quality. I examine how she used resiliency to overcome significant problems that beset the Frontier Nursing Service, including geographic and transportation challenges, shortages of money, facility, and personnel, the poverty and difficult lives of the people they served, as well as her own personal losses and health issues. That Mary Breckenridge would spend her life in service to others is not surprising, given her family lineage of political power and public service. Her great-grandfather was a U.S. Senator and served as Attorney General of the United States, and her grandfather, John C. Breckenridge, was Vice President of the United States under President Buchanan. Mary Breckenridge's father, Clifton Breckenridge, represented Arkansas for 12 years in Congress before serving as minister to Russia in St. Petersburg. Like many young women at the turn of the 20th century, Mary Breckenridge struggled to choose between the life of a modern woman and the domestic life expected of her by her family and society. She attended a Swiss boarding school and then graduated from a finishing school at age 18 but craved both adventure and usefulness saying, I wanted to climb mountains and to wander through the most difficult and inaccessible parts of the world. I also wanted to have eight children. Realizing that she could not have both, she married Arkansas lawyer, Henry Ruffner Morrison in 1904. But happiness was not to be. The couple experienced difficulty starting a family and then Henry became ill with appendicitis and died soon after the couple's first anniversary. As a widow at age 24, she wanted to avoid what she termed her fam's family solicitude and decided, I wanted to give care, not to receive it. But she possessed no tangible skills to be of use to society and said, there was nothing I was fitted to do. In searching for meaning for her life, she spent a summer at a settlement school for girls. There, while keeping vigil at the bedside of a young girl dying of typhoid fever, Breckenridge envisioned the purpose for her life. It came over me that if I took training as a nurse, I could be of use to such children. Mary Breckenridge completed her nursing training at the St. Luke Hospital School of Nursing 
in New York City in 1910 at age 29. During a post-graduation sojourn to Arkansas, Breckenridge met and later married Richard Thompson. Their first child, a beloved son named Clifton Breckenridge, or Brecky Thompson, was born in 1914. But a difficult second pregnancy resulted in a daughter named Polly, who was born two months premature and lived only a few hours. Just two years after Polly's death, four-year-old Brecky developed an intestinal obstruction and a massive infection and died in January 1918. Now age 37 and devastated by her two children's deaths, Breckenridge was adrift. After struggling with longtime marital strain, her marriage to Richard Thompson was nearly at the breaking point. Thus, Breckenridge concluded that she needed to leave Arkansas. She would later make the split official by divorcing her husband and legally retaking her birth name of Breckenridge. Breckenridge considered world events at that time in early 1918. The Great War was raging in Europe, as well as her skills as a trained nurse and her fluency in French and German from her Swiss school days. Within a few days of her son Brecky's death, she volunteered for duty with the American Red Cross in Europe, writing of the unspeakable blessing it is to be equipped with a profession of real use to which to turn at a time like this. While wading through a lengthy process for clearance to travel to France to assist the war effort, the Great War ended and Breckenridge volunteered with a privately funded organization known as CARD, the French language acronym for the American Committee for Devastated France. CARD's purpose in post-Great War France was emergency relief to provide places to sleep, food and clothing, to care for the children, to restore the soil to production. When Breckenridge arrived in France in February 1919, her first task was to assess the communities that CARD served. The needs she identified were vast and negatively affected the health of the French people. Food and clothing were practically non-existent. Roads, bridges, railroads, farmland, and livestock were in ruins. And there were few, if any, young men available to service and drive vehicles needed to transport life-saving supplies. Breckenridge and her card colleagues identified children's nutrition as one of the most pressing concerns. Through a large-scale process in which nurses weighed, measured, and examined hundreds of children, Breckenridge concluded that the majority of all children under 14 are distinctly subnormal. In a March 1919 letter to her mother, Breckenridge described a French family she had been caring for and saying, no milk of any kind to be had for the baby. If I could give a goat to every family that had a baby, I think we could go far towards saving men that are dying. I wish I had a thousand goats right now. I wish I had 50. With this, Breckenridge launched a campaign to entice well-to-do family members and friends in the United States to provide funds for goats for French families. Although cows would have been the more obvious choice for milk for small children, Goats were more practical in the hilly terrain, less expensive to purchase, and more economical for impoverished families to keep. Within weeks of her first appeal to her mother, Mary Breckenridge's letters had made the rounds in a network of extended family and friends, many of whom gave money and started goat funds of their own. Two months after the original letter asking for goats, Breckenridge wrote again, saying, I have seldom been more moved than by all the goat funds. It is indeed the most necessary thing for this country. Another pressing issue in France at that time was moving desperately needed food and clothing to the French as they returned to their homes. Transportation was complicated by the utter destruction of bridges, roads, and railways, and the near total lack of able-bodied men to transport supplies. Breckenridge and her card colleagues tackled the problem by identifying young female volunteers to drive small trucks on any passable road to deliver supplies. After working for more than two years in France, Breckenridge's commitment to serving children had solidified, but she realized that it was time to return home to begin work on behalf of America's children. As her plans were continuing to take shape concerning the type of project she would undertake, she considered the type of worker best suited to make a difference, 
as well as the location on which she should focus. Breckenridge concluded, In France, midwives were not nurses. In America, nurses were not midwives. In England, trained women were both nurses and midwives. After I had met British nurse midwives in France, it grew upon me that nurse midwifery was the logical response to the needs of the young child in rural America. Much had been done for city children, whereas remotely rural children had been neglected. My work would be for them. As Breckenridge considered her own qualifications, she identified additional education and experience she needed to be able to embark on her major project. Upon her return to the United States, she audited courses at Teachers College, Columbia University in public health nursing, psychology, statistics, biology, and nursing education. She then traveled to England to train as a midwife at the British Hospital for Mothers and Babies, and then on to Scotland to study the remote Scottish Highlands and Islands Medical and Nursing Service as a model for rural health care and district midwifery care. Mary Breckenridge selected Kentucky for her project because generations of her ancestors had lived there and accumulated tremendous social and political capital. Moreover, a successful demonstration of the new concept of combining nursing with midwifery in that remote rural location would validate that if it could be done there, it could be done anywhere. In early 1925, Breckenridge returned to Kentucky and assembled a committee of leading citizens, including physicians, university presidents, respected tradesmen, and a newspaper editor. Breckenridge recognized the importance of these connections and reported later, another reason for locating the demonstration in Kentucky lay in the fact that I had hundreds of kindred and family friends in that state who were willing to back me up. On May 28, 1925, the first meeting of the Kentucky Committee for Mothers and Babies, later renamed the Frontier Nursing Service, was called to order. But Breckenridge and her staff had their work cut out for them in the time-intensive and physically demanding work of providing nursing care, especially in a remote rural area. Without proper management of privies, human waste often ended up in the creeks, and soil to which downhill neighbors were exposed, particularly children who walked barefoot during the warmer months. The battle against the resulting parasites, like hookworms, was one the FNS nurses waged every day. Chronic infestation with hookworm often left its human hosts severely anemic. According to Breckenridge, worms are the curse of the rural child. It is not uncommon to find young children with high fever and rapid pulse and respirations who recover as soon as they have been wormed. Severe eye infections like trachoma were common and sometimes resulted in situations like one Breckenridge described by saying, there was a four week old baby rushed by the nurse on horseback to our hospital with both eyes so blinded by pus that it was impossible to tell at first whether any sight could be saved. That baby required the nurses to administer a treatment every 15 minutes for 24 hours, after which the baby's condition improved and at least some sight was saved. Burned children represented another common patient type, often young girls whose skirts would catch fire when their domestic duties require that they work near the home's open flames. Breckenridge estimated that at any one time there were up to six such girls admitted as patients in the hospital until the nurses could convince families to use fire screens and more importantly, dress their little girls in overalls rather than in long skirts. Typhoid and diphtheria were endemic in the area and required a massive amount of time and energy for FNS nurses to prevent and treat. Concerning efforts to stem the tide of typhoid, Breckenridge reported, we not only had the sick ones to nurse, but wherever typhoid was reported, we felt it was our duty to send nurses to inoculate the whole creek. And at times that inoculation process required nearly a day's horseback journey for nurses who often had to make four such trips because many people turned up for their first shots on the nurse's second visit. 
Diphtheria made itself known to the nurses when they heard of a baby whose family described as having had a risin in the throat and choked to death. Breckenridge reported that her experiences with diphtheria in France and in Kentucky made her dread this disease in children more than any other. But the primary reason that most FNS, or FNS nurses were also midwives was maternity work. Although it was a new concept in the area, the nurse midwives worked to convince local women of the importance of prenatal visits to allow the nurse midwives to provide nutritional counseling as well as manage complications before they became emergencies. Well-trained and experienced in managing labors and births, the midwives attended women in their homes in the vast majority of cases and consulted with the FNS medical director or another doctor in the event of emergencies outside the midwife's training. And the sheer volume of maternity cases was staggering. In the first quarter century of the service, FNS staff delivered 8,596 registered maternity patients. Nearly three quarters of those were deliveries in the woman's own home, attended by one of the FNS district nurse midwives. But getting to those maternity cases in time was a constant challenge. The FNS service area was devoid of roads, yet was covered with steep mountains with elevations up to 2,600 feet. Horses and mules, ridden either around or up and over mountains or along creek beds, were necessary for all transportation. Breckenridge described the riding as always difficult and often dangerous. During the winter, when the cold spells come and the streams freeze over, the horses, shod with ice nails, slip and stumble and often crash through with bleeding hawks. When the tides come, the fords of the unbridged river are impassable. Additionally, patients were scattered across the landscape in tiny family clusters in the small valleys between mountains. Based on her experiences in France and the United Kingdom, Breckenridge determined that a decentralized organization of the service and its facilities was the only way to design a rural service. The hospital was placed at the center in blue on this map and the service headquarters called Wendover plus each of the six district nursing centers or outposts in red on this map fanned out from the center. With this configuration, the one or two nurses assigned to each outpost were no farther than five to six miles from any patient, about an hour's ride on horseback although the nurses covered a district of about 80 square miles. Breckenridge summarized this by saying, in such a country, it is not a question of the patient's distance from his nurse, but of how long it takes her to reach him. Time and not mileage is the factor involved in daily travel and in all emergencies. Those emergencies occurred regularly, some of which were outside the scope of the nurse's training and experience. In some of those situations, the patient needed the surgical skills of a doctor, but weather and distance made getting a doctor there in time to make a difference another matter entirely. According to one report of the FNS nurse's work during the 1930s, in most instances, there is no telephone service available and someone must ride the entire distance, varying from four to 20 miles to summon the doctor who usually lives in some small village or town where he maintains a practice. It is often impossible for him to leave his patients for, any, for the length of time necessary to make a trip into the mountains. In winter, when snow covers the ground and the creek beds are frozen, it is difficult, if not impossible, for the mountaineer to go for the doctor and equally out of the question for the doctor to come to the patient. Nonetheless, the midwife's responsibility was heavy to not only recognize complications and call the doctor promptly, but also to remain with the patient and do what she could for her. One district midwife experienced such a situation when she quickly diagnosed a shoulder presentation after arriving at a mountain cabin to care for a woman in labor. The midwife dispatched the husband on her own horse with a note for the FNS physician to come right away. Two hours of anxious waiting later, as the midwife realized that she might be called to act before help arrived, she heard the hoofbeats of the approaching horses ridden by the doctor and a midwifery supervisor. The doctor scrubbed while the midwife prepared the cabin by extinguishing all open flames. 
the supervisor administered ether, the midwife held a flashlight, and the doctor pushed the baby up, turned him, and brought the baby out, all by the light of one small flashlight. In most situations, though, the FNS nurses were well prepared to handle anything, and Breckenridge crafted a system to encourage nurses to work to the fullest extent of their training. FNS nurses carried two meticulously packed sets of saddlebags, one for general calls and one for midwifery cases. The midwifery bag alone weighed 48 pounds and contained everything the midwife would need to create a sterile field, manage a normal labor and birth, and respond to emergencies. The most important item the nurses carried, though, was a copy of the FNS medical routines. Written by physicians who comprised Frontier's Medical Advisory Committee, the medical routines functioned as standing orders to both guide the nurses' actions and form their legal basis for practice. But patients' medical emergencies were not the only daily challenge. Breckenridge understood that if the FNS was to be successful, she would need to guard against damage from natural disasters like floods. On the advice of local people, Breckenridge resisted the temptation to build on flat and easily accessible bottomland. Instead, she invested the additional resources necessary to ensure that all FNS building foundations reached solid rock for long-term stability so that every building down to the barns and chicken houses must be located well above the highest floodwater mark. The building of the hospital presented difficulties almost unimaginable to those whose frame of reference is an urban landscape. Workers quarried rock and hauled it dozens of miles to the hospital site on mule-drawn wooden sleds. Sewage was dealt with through septic systems whose drainage fields tended to cause slides of the mountainsides. But not all slides were caused by drainage fields. Mary Breckenridge wrote, Faith isn't the only thing that moves mountains. Sub-zero temperatures crack them, as do torrential rains. Whenever they crack, they slide. One especially severe slide began at the hospital steps and continued down the steep mountainside. The building itself did not move, but Breckenridge joked that it began to look as though we would need a derrick to draw the patients up to the hospital and then let them down. A series of retaining walls built with funds from various donors provided approximately 20 feet of steady and level space from the hospital steps to the edge of the mountain slope. The dark arrow on the slide points to the area between the front facade of the hospital and the narrow ledge next to the slope down the mountain. And I'll show you one more image of the hospital's placement relative to the mountain slope. Whereas the last image with Mary Breckenridge showed the mountain slope on the right and the hospital on the left, this image is oriented so we're looking the opposite direction. In addition to the placement of buildings, Breckenridge instituted procedures to manage the emotional and physical toll of the work on the FNS nurses. They lived in relative isolation and with chronic sleep deprivation from long intense vigils at labors and births. Breckenridge insisted that district nurse midwives take regular vacations away from the mountains to recharge flagging energy levels. This commitment remained in spite of the difficulties associated with finding and paying for coverage. During all but the most economically devastated periods during the Great Depression, Breckenridge insisted on employing housekeeping help at the outpost nursing centers to relieve the nurses from cleaning, cooking, and caring for the cows and chickens that provided milk and eggs. Breckenridge instituted another source of emotional renewal for FNS staff, the comforting ritual of afternoon tea, an English high tea custom, to relax and enhance social bonds. Each afternoon at 4 p.m., all non-urgent work stopped, and FNS staff members who happened to be near the services headquarters gathered to enjoy a cup of properly made tea, a small stack, snack, and a period of relaxation and reconnection with friends and colleagues. Away from tea time, certain aspects of the environment introduced dangers to the nurse midwives on the districts, such as treacherous trails, pitch black nights, snakes, and feuds. However, Breckenridge developed and enforced procedures that helped to keep the nurses safe. 
FNS policy dictated that no employee ride alone at night on the districts, and that the nurses wear the FNS uniform at all times. One nurse reported that the traditional uniform served as a symbol of protection, respected even by mountaineers who had been drinking and were involved in local feuding. The nurses in this uniform had no fear in answering calls any time a man would come, night or day, to request someone to deliver his wife in their mountain home. Indeed, the FNS uniform distinguished the nurses from much maligned alcohol revenuers riding through the area looking for stills. For the same reason, nurses were prohibited from carrying a camera with them, lest someone think they were trying to document illegal activity. And if you're wondering about the source of the images on, in this presentation, many of these were photographs taken for publicity purposes and carefully planned and staged. Policy also dictated that nurses not dismount their horses when in trouble. One nurse learned firsthand the wisdom of this rule when she happened upon a huge copperhead snake. When she called out to the nearby family for help, the nurse realized how quickly mountain children were expected to grow up. The family sent their six-year-old son to cut off the snake's head with a cleaver. Another and larger challenge with which Breckenridge wrestled was maintaining sufficient cash flow to keep the services budget in the black. The entire local economy ran on precious little cash, so little in fact that local families rarely paid the $5 midwifery fee in cash. This fee included complete prenatal care, care for the entire labor and the birth, and home nursing visits every day for 10 days after the baby was born. Indeed, mountain families paid in quilts, handmade split bottom chairs, or in the husband's labor to mend fences or whitewash barns. In one situation in which a woman delivered her fifth baby after her husband had died, the woman's oldest son, age 10, brought a chair he had made saying, I aim to bring you more till the baby is all paid off. But as valued as these goods and services were, they did not infuse the service with income needed to pay salaries or buy supplies. So Breckenridge turned her attention to fundraising. She crafted an image of a remote and adventure-filled location serving patients worthy of their care and maximized this message in every fundraising venue. Breckenridge emphasized the FNS's rural environment to allow potential donors to vicariously return to an idyllic era. Breckenridge referred to her trips between remote eastern Kentucky and the large cities where she attended meetings with potential donors as travel in and out of centuries. Each time I made the trip, I moved from the 19th into the 20th century and back from the 20th into the 19th. Breckenridge organized donors and friends of the Frontier Nursing Service in a system of committees located in the largest cities of the Northeast and Midwestern United States. Committees were comprised of the wealthiest and most prominent citizens and represented a variety of social and political viewpoints. Some of the most well-known committee members included Eleanor Roosevelt, famed obstetrician Joseph DeLee, Clara Ford, the wife of automobile mogul Henry Ford, and Congresswoman Frances Payne Bolton of Ohio. FNS committee members hosted and attended fundraising events and donated money that funded FNS operations. Mary Breckenridge traveled thousands of miles each year to attend these events, although she prided herself in simply telling the Frontier Nursing Service story at each event, relying on the power of an FNS FNS's work in people to prompt giving, rather than expressly asking attendees for donations. Another fundraising approach included a strategic communication vehicle, the Quarterly Bulletin, a publication sent four times each year to FNS donors and friends. The Quarterly Bulletin contained articles that incorporated images of remote terrain, overlaid with visions of great beauty, allowing readers and potential donors to return to a bygone era where life was simple and appealingly rugged. Breckenridge included the following description of the rugged beauty on her district rounds on horseback. We first rode up hell for certain, a horribly rough creek about eight miles long, 
Then we got into a great primeval forest, extending for many miles in all directions, with trails leading in a most confusing zigzag. But you could comb the world without finding anything more beautiful than that forest. No lover of luxury would ever see that beauty, because he wouldn't be able to reach it. It can only be reached by horseback riders and hard riders at that. To potential donors, Breckenridge emphasized that the mountain people the FNS served were hardworking, proud, and worthy poor. A visiting journalist noted that despite desperate poverty, whole families work early and late plowing, planting, building fences, cutting wood, tending gardens, cows, chickens, and mules. Mary Breckenridge reinforced the concept for the journalist telling him, they're too proud to beg. In all the years of our service, I could count on the fingers of my two hands all those who have asked us for charity. To assist in making the Frontier Nursing Services work sustainable, Breckenridge needed to arrange for a large workforce to provide help with non-nursing tasks that extended far beyond that of the housekeeping help at the outpost nursing centers I described a few minutes ago. But a major challenge was a financial one. How could the FNS afford to pay for these services when there was scarcely enough cash to pay nurses' salaries? Recalling the ways in which she and other card leaders used young French women after the Great War, Breckenridge devised a volunteer transport system. She formalized Frontier's version in 1928, calling them couriers. Couriers were young adults, almost exclusively women in their late teens and early 20s, who volunteered their time for six to eight weeks. Couriers' duties included ferrying supplies across the rugged mountain terrain, caring for the service's valuable transportation assets, the horses, carrying vital messages in an area without telephones or reliable U.S. mail service, transporting sick patients, and escorting the service's many visitors completing mundane chores that did not require the expertise of the highly trained nurses, whose time was better spent on nursing activities as well. But perhaps an even more significant outcome of the courier program was its effects on creating a network of FNS ambassadors. Breckenridge recognized that she could market the courier experience and use it as a way to exponentially increase the nationwide fraternity of wealthy individuals who had a personal connection to the Frontier Nursing Service. Drawn from the daughters, nieces, granddaughters, and friends of Mary Breckenridge's wealthy friends and relatives, couriers were often upper-class young women who craved an experience that differed drastically from their usual, often sheltered, urban or suburban lives. Courier service represented adventure and excitement Bearing supplies on horseback through rushing creeks or holding a lamp to allow the midwife to see while attending a birth in a dark mountain cabin. One early courier, being from a privileged background, sought the courier experience to help her become part of a life that was so different from anything else I have ever known. And another courier went to Frontier because she was burning with desire to do something different. The courier experience boosted the young women's self-confidence and resulted in a maturing effect. One courier successfully negotiated a frightening situation and came away with an increased sense of what she could accomplish when she was called on to act. She said, the streams were getting higher and higher, the horses couldn't touch the bottom and we really did swim, and I was quite pleased with my achievement. I thought this was quite successful. In fact, she returned home, and her father commented that she had grown up six years in six weeks. Even after the weeks they worked in Kentucky, Courier's contributions to Frontier continued when they returned home to their wealthy families by becoming lifelong financial supporters of the Frontier Nursing Service. Seeing the services work up close allowed the Couriers to provide their friends and family members with first-hand accounts of Frontier's extraordinary work for the people of Eastern Kentucky. One courier wrote in her journal about a situation that was ideal for sharing with others after she returned home. When she was on her way to a home visit with one of the nurses on horseback, she said she was 
amazed at all the people the nurse spoke to and asked about their health or some member of their family. This trip makes me see what the whole organization is about, why the nurses have to go by horseback and how the people really need them. But in 1939, when the FNS was in its seventh year, Mary Breckenridge faced a personal crisis that threatened her ability to continue her physically demanding work in the mountains. On a drizzly afternoon, Breckenridge was riding a horse who tended to be nervous, especially in unfamiliar surroundings, and the flowing FNS uniformed raincoat was among those sights unfamiliar to this horse. When a puff of wind blew Breckenridge's coat open, the horse bolted up the trail. Neither able to calm the horse nor get rid of the raincoat, Breckenridge simply hung on as she saw a sheer mountain face on one side and a 90-foot drop to a creek on the other side. After horse and rider covered three miles of mountain trail, Breckenridge fell, striking the ground with incredible force. Local men fashioned a stretcher and carried Breckenridge through the forest. In shock and in considerable pain, Breckenridge nonetheless maintained her composure as the leader of the Frontier Nursing Service. Reflecting on her patient's ability to avoid crying out in pain, she later said, I felt that the honor of the service demanded the same stoicism for me, so I joked with those carrying the stretcher that I would have dieted had I known they were going to carry me. Once she was away from the men and had been given morphine, she said, it was wonderful to be able to drop that front and no longer pretend that nothing was the matter. An orthopedic evaluation in Lexington, Kentucky revealed a crushed second lumbar vertebra and doctors prescribed a treatment plan of months on a Bradford frame, followed by wearing a metal back brace for an undetermined period of time. Dazed, in pain, frightened about the effects this injury would have on the ability of the FNS to carry on with its work, Breckenridge described her emotional, emotional state at that time as one of a breakdown of morale like that of a shell-shocked soldier. Within hours after a message of support and a cable from a longtime friend, Breckenridge rallied. I began to come out of my slump, which was just as well because I had quite a lot of work to do. And she did, both from her bed immediately after the accident and as she battled pain and altered physical abilities the rest of her life. Although she gradually increased her activity level, she was in nearly constant pain, comparing it to a great dental drill gnawing through my back day after day and hour after hour. Complaining little, she compensated by spending hours each day working from her bed, propped up with pillows. And when the road network was modernized and the main mode of transportation became the Jeep, couriers were trained on how best to help Breckenridge. Anxious to get into a more comfortable position, Breckenridge often employed her driver, child, can't you go faster? Once at their destination, a specific routine eased Breckenridge's discomfort. One courier recalled, she'd lie flat on her back on the floor and you had to pull on her heels. Once she'd done that, she'd get up and be fine. But in September, 1939, England's declaration of war against Hitler's Germany would lead to the gravest threat the Frontier Nursing Service had ever faced. Most FNS nurses were British and would need to return to their homeland to support the war effort. Regardless of how well Breckenridge had handled challenges previously, the lack of enough experienced nurse midwives was nearly impossible to overcome. Emotionally and practically devastating, an FNS leader described this exodus in an American Journal of Nursing article saying, 18 of the service's 22 nurse midwives from Great Britain, our source of supply closed, the call home sounded. As they heard of the fall of nations, nurse after nurse left us with regret. And FNS leaders lamented in the service's annual report, the 15th fiscal year of the Frontier Nursing Service has been the most difficult through which the service has ever passed because of the administrative problems brought about by the war. Because educational opportunities for nurse midwives in the United States were limited, it became clear that the Frontier Nursing Service would need to train its own staff by opening a school and quickly. 
determined to overcome what was the most significant challenge to the survival of the FNS to date, Breckenridge and the executive committee moved quickly and the school opened with its first class of two students on November 1, 1939. To address shortages of faculty and classroom and student dorm space, Breckenridge and her staff shifted available nurse midwifery staff to cover patient needs as well as teaching responsibilities and within two years raised funds to build a small classroom and dormitory building followed a decade, la decade later by the much larger Hagen Dormitory. Faculty modeled the school's curriculum after world-renowned British midwifery programs, including lecture and practical experiences and the latest in scientific principles. The school's growth was slow but steady. Before the end of the Second World War, the school had graduated 36 nurse midwives with a large proportion of those graduates remaining in the area to serve FNS patients. But perhaps more important to the larger Frontier Nursing Service story, the school's success has rivaled that of the FNS itself. The original format of the school, a residential program in the FNS area in Kentucky, continued for 50 years and graduated 550 nurse midwives and nurse practitioners. With changing times, the school transitioned to a distance learning format in 1990 and is now known as Frontier Nursing University, with close to 2,000 current nurse midwifery and nurse practitioner students and more than 4,000 alumni living and working all over the United States and around the world. In conclusion, in this paper, I have explored Mary Breckenridge's life as an exemplar of a resiliency a characteristic the American Psychological Association defines as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant stress. From her grief at the deaths of her two children, Mary Breckenridge identified the purpose that would guide the remainder of her life, and from the wreckage of post-Great War rural France, she honed skills that would inform her work in rural Kentucky. But Mary Breckenridge cultivated not only personal resilience, she also developed leadership resilience to inspire others to walk along with her on demanding paths. Facing difficult geography, severe weather, and overwhelming patient needs, Mary Breckenridge developed a decentralized organization to facilitate her nurses' work. Facing impoverished patients and a cash-poor economy, Mary Breckenridge inspired philanthropic support through a system of fundraising and FNS ambassadors outside the mountains. Facing the loss of her nursing workforce at the start of the Second World War, Mary Breckenridge opened a school, thus replenishing the ranks of her nurse midwives, as well as creating one of the most enduring legacies of her work. Indeed, Mary Breckenridge's leadership of the Frontier Nursing Service modeled adaptation and persistence. In her words, we take heart even though the trail is hard and the blazing. Thank you.